Thank you for downloading or streaming this message from Emmanuel Church. We are one church with multiple locations, and we believe God wants to bless you right where you are. In a few moments, you're going to hear some practical teaching from God's Word that I believe will be inspiring and relevant to your life. First, though, if you haven't yet experienced Emmanuel Live, we encourage you to go to our website, eclife.org, to check out our service times and locations so that you can experience Emmanuel in person or through our online campus. If this message blesses you and you'd like to support the ministry financially, again, you can go to eclife.org and click on the Giving tab and choose Online Campus at your campus. Thanks again for joining us today, and we hope this message will be an encouragement to you on your spiritual journey. Well, good morning, Emmanuel Church. How are you feeling today? <clears throat> I want to welcome everyone right now joining us at all of our campuses, whether you're here at Greenwood or at Garfield Park or Banta or Franklin or down in Seymour, Indiana, or one of our microsites, or if you're watching on our online campus, we want to welcome all of you. If you're a first-time guest here, we want to give you a very special welcome. Can we give it up for all of our first-time guests? Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for being part. We are in a series right now as a church called Detours, and we've been talking about this idea how, you know, life is sort of like you're driving down the highway, and you're on your way somewhere, you're trying to get to a destination, you, maybe you have a time that you need to get there, and all of a sudden the road is closed. You come upon a sign like this one, and all of a sudden you find yourself off on some other road you never thought you'd be on, you're going to be late, you feel out of control, you feel disoriented, and you are hating life. Yes? You ever been there? I hate getting on a detour. Uh, but that's the way life is. Life is filled with detours. You're in a career, you're working at a job, and you think, man, this is going to be great. You start a 401k, and the company downsizes, and they eliminate your job. Detour, right? You're in a relationship, you think it's going great, you're talking about marriage, maybe you're trying to buy a ring or something like that, and uh, she wants out, he wants out, somebody cheats, right? Detour, right? I mean, you're, you're getting ready to retire, and, and things are looking great, you got your health, you go ahead and retire, and you get sick, you go to the doctor, and you have cancer. I mean, these things happen to us, and if we don't handle the detours in our life well, it could permanently derail our life. That's why this series is so important. How do you navigate the detours in your life in such a way that they actually make you better? Like you actually become a better person, a deeper person, a stronger person in your faith. So in this series, what we want to do is talk about some of the big detours in life. Week number one, we talked about the construction detours, right? The road is closed because they're trying to make it better, right? God wants to make something new out of in you. He wants to bring something new from you or in you or develop something in you. Those are the construction detours. Last week, Pastor Cody did a great job talking about the self-inflicted detours. He said last week, I, I love watching, he said, you guys are sinners. I love that. Uh, good job, Cody. Didn't he do a great job last week, all of our campuses? Yeah. The self-inflicted detours. He talked about how to navigate through those. Today, I want to talk to you about the detours caused by accidents. Accidents of other people, because a lot of times that's the way it is, right? You're driving along. You've done nothing wrong. Someone else has crashed, and now you have to get off the road, and now your life has turned around, and you're on some path you never thought you'd be on because someone else crashed, right? Sometimes it's our own accidents. A lot of times it's the accidents of others that derail our life. You're like, man, you're talking to me right now because my life is detoured because of my brother or my sister or my mother. I know. That's how life goes. What is an accident? I looked it up in Webster's Dictionary. Here's what Mr. Webster has to say about accidents. An accident is an unforeseen 
an unplanned event or circumstance. Now, people love this definition. And here's why I think people love this definition, which, by the way, I mostly disagree with. I'll get to that in a second. People love this definition because it totally shifts blame away from the person. Anybody raising kids? Have you ever heard them say this? But dad, it was an accident. It's not my fault. It was an accident. It was an unforeseen, unplanned event that came out of nowhere. You know, and I smashed mom's vase and it exploded. I don't know how it happened. It's an accident. We love accidents because we love to shift blame away from ourselves. Are you, are you willing to admit that? Yes, yes, as a human being. I mean, Adam did it. Eve did it in the garden. Like, I didn't, this is, the, the devil made me do it, right? Adam says, she made me do it, right? I was looking up some, some common excuses that people give to police officers and insurance companies. You know where I'm going with this. These are actual statements given to police officers and insurance companies. Watch this. This is great for car, about car accidents. The telephone pole was approaching fast. <laughs> I was attempting to swerve out of its path when it struck my front end. How about that? I didn't know telephone poles move and strike automobiles. I had no clue. This is so insightful. Check this one out. The pedestrian had no idea which direction to turn, so I ran him over. True statement. Right there. Unbelievable. Those pesky pedestrians, you know, pick a path. Listen to this one. As I approached the intersection, a stop sign suddenly appeared in a place where there had never been a stop sign before. I was unable to stop in time and could not avoid the accident. Those stop signs, I tell you what, they just pop up out of nowhere. I mean, have you seen them? They just pop right out of the ground. And it's too late to stop. How about this one? Leaving home for work, I drove out of my driveway straight into a bus. Hold on, hold on. Those buses, they come regularly. The bus was five minutes early. Do you see what the problem is here? It's not, I mean, I, how dare this bus show up early? I'm trying to pull out of my driveway here. We love accidents because it shifts the blame. It's like this unplanned, unforeseen event that takes place. So I'm looking at this definition in Webster. I'm like, man, I disagree with that 100%. Well, 95%. Because I'm sure there are about 5% of accidents that are like unplanned and, you know, just random. You know, your tire blows up on the highway, even though it's probably your fault because it was, didn't have enough air in it. But anyway, and then you crash or something like that. I came up with a better definition. Uh, Danny Anderson's definition of an accident. A negative event caused by human stupidity. I mean, I, I, mean, I kid, okay. Not that I didn't mean to say that. Actually, I did. But a negative event caused by human error. Think about it. Isn't this why most accidents take place? People are not paying attention. So they saw their finger off, right? They, they're looking at their phone, so they crash into the person in front of them. Isn't this how it works? Like, they're not paying attention. I remember when I was nine years old, I was a very active child and liked to do crazy stuff. And, um, and so one day, I, I, there was this six-foot wall by my house and, and with a fence on top of it. And I thought, man, I want to climb that wall. And, and once I get to the top of the wall, I, wanna, I, I don't know where I got this idea from, maybe probably Indiana Jones or something like that. But I want to tie a rope around my waist, and I want to tie the rope to the fence, and then I want to suspend I should have let go and let the rope hold me, you know, and, and it's dangerous down there, you know. So I get up there and, and, I, and I tie the rope around my waist and tie the rope to the fence and, and I'm ready to go. So I just let go. And I don't know how to tie a knot. And that thing came apart so quick. I fell six feet down, fell on my left arm. I snapped this arm in half like a twig. I really was a twig. And, and I snapped my arm and I'm like, oh, I'm screaming, I'm in pain. And I try to get up and my arm doesn't move off the ground. No joke. It just flopped there. It just stayed right there. And I was like, what's that? So I'm screaming. I take my arm like this. I put it on my shirt. I grab with my fist and I run home. I go upstairs and I'm talking to my mom and dad. I'm like, I broke my, screaming, I broke my arm. My dad's like, no, you didn't. Get over here. It ain't broke. Come here. You know how dad's all right. Now that's not how he said it, but that's kind of how I heard it. He's like, no, it's broken. I promise. I promise. Man, that thing, we went to the doctor. He didn't believe me until we got the x-ray back. The arm was like this and it had done like this, bone over bone. 
Was that an accident? And, and I know all the mothers out there are going, yes, my poor baby, it's an accident. <laughs> that was not an accident. That was human stupidity. Yes? And this is the case in 95% of the time. Someone wasn't paying attention. They crashed. Someone wasn't paying attention. They didn't pay their bills on time. Someone wasn't paying attention and they didn't love their spouse well. Someone didn't pay attention and the business started getting behind. Someone didn't pay attention and they had an accident. Yes? And a lot of times people's lack of paying attention impacts you and you have to pay the price. Now somebody's got to live in your basement and you got to pay someone's tuition again because they didn't pay attention in class, right? And you got to come and pay off someone's debt. And now you're on a path you never thought you'd be on because someone else wasn't paying attention. How do you navigate those, those types of accidents? That's what I want to talk to you about today. It's hard. It gets emotional. You get angry. What's wrong with you? If you had been paying attention, this wouldn't have happened, which is mostly true, right? So you get angry, frustrated. It's also incredibly time-consuming because now you've got to take your time to do you know, your money and your resources to help this person out. I think it can also be very confusing, especially if the accident is severe. It's like, man, where's God in all this, man? I mean, if he loved you, if he loved me, why would he let my, this happen to you and then it impacts me? And in fact, I would argue, I would make the argument as a pastor that, 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 that the accidents that take place in our lives, whether they're caused by other people or caused by us, the things that happen, especially the severe ones, are probably the number one cause for atheism. They really are. Even the accidents that, that just happen, like tsunamis and famines and tornadoes, Earthquakes. I would, I would make the argument that those are the number one causes for atheism. John the Baptist struggled with this. He really did. John the Baptist was Jesus' cousin. He's the one that said, look, there's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John the Baptist was the one who baptized Jesus. You with me? You know who he is? He's a, he knew who Jesus was. He declared who Jesus was. Yet, after calling Fair, uh, 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 Herod out for his sexual immorality. He was sleeping with his brother's wife. So John the Baptist says, you shouldn't do that. Has John thrown into jail? You know the story. He's in jail. And what happens to John? He begins to doubt. He calls some of his followers together and he says, you go talk to Jesus and you ask him this question right here. Luke chapter 7, verse 19. Are you the Messiah? How could John the Baptist ask this question? He's the one who baptized Jesus. He's the one who said, I'm not worthy to untie this guy's shoes. I'm not, like, he's the man. Now, all of a sudden, are you the Messiah we've been expecting? Should we keep looking for someone else who would bust their cousin out of jail? Ah, now we find out why John was doubting. Man, here I am. I'm Jesus' cousin. I baptized the dude. I, I, I call... Herod out for his adultery and his fornication. Here I am locked up, and Jesus hasn't even come to save me. I'm not even sure if this guy's legit. Hello. You ever been there? Why would this happen? Why is God allowing this to happen? So Jesus says, you go tell John something. Tell John that the lame walk, the deaf hear, the blind see, the dead are raised, and the gospel's preached to the poor. And then I want you to tell him one more thing. Listen to, these, listen to this sentence, verse 23. God blesses those who do not fall away because of me. Now, I have thought long and hard about this statement. What does this mean? You know what it means? Jesus is saying, you tell John that God blesses those who do not doubt or trip up or stumble over what I decide to allow to take place in this life. You know, he didn't bust John out of jail. He left him in jail. And John got what? John got his... What does that mean for you and me? That means that God sometimes does not answer the prayer to save the person from cancer. He doesn't always protect your children from harm. He doesn't always show up and save the day. There are times where God allows accidents and bad things to happen. And Jesus says, God blesses those who do not stumble over how I run my planet, over how I run my universe. How do you get there? 
where you're so strong in your faith that the accidents and the difficulties and the evils and the tornadoes and the earthquakes and the whatever happens doesn't shake your faith. That's what I want to talk to you about today. Three ideas. How do we do that? How do we navigate the accidents caused by others and maybe even the accidents that we've caused? Number one, repent. Repent. Now, this word has a little bit of a, you know, perhaps a negative connotation to some of you because of the church you grew up in. You heard perhaps a person up here yell at you with this word with red face and veins popping out of the neck. Repent! You know, or you're going to go to hell or something like that. And, and so let me help you out a little bit. That's, that's an interesting perspective. But here's what the word actually means. It means to turn around. It means to change your path. It means to do a 180. You were going this way, and now you, do a, you repent and you go this way. You change the way you think in 180 degrees. That's what the word actually means. One time Jesus gathered some people around him, and he said some really difficult, confusing things. He would often do that, but this one is really difficult. He says, hey guys, come here, let's chat. Do you remember that one time when Pilate killed a bunch of people who were worshiping at the temple? Evidently, there was some sort of massacre that Pilate did, and, and it was a horrible situation. And, and Jesus says, do you remember when that happened? We're like, yeah. And then he says this, did those people get massacred by Pilate because they were worse sinners than you? And Jesus, it's a rhetorical question. He says, no, that's not why they got massacred. That's not why the Holocaust took place. That's not why certain things happen. We think sometimes, well, oh, God must be punishing those people. And then he continues, and he says this, and what about the 18 people who died when the Tower of Siloam fell on them? Evidently, there was some sort of tower back in those days that just fell over without you know, any notice, and 18 people were killed. Listen to the question. Were they the worst sinners in all of Jerusalem? Because that was the, the, the thought process. Like, like, if something bad happens to you, like an accident, the tower falls on you, you must have been really bad. God is punishing you. Jesus says, No. That's not the case. Don't assume that. Now, sometimes God does punish certain people, and, and, and that is the case, but it's not a slam dunk. Every accident cannot be explained by God simply saying that God punishes people. He says, no, that's not the case at all. And then Jesus says this, very confusing. And I tell you again that unless you, and here's the word, unless you do what? Say it with me. Repent or do a 180 or turn around, you will perish as well. What does this mean Jesus is saying, these people didn't die in this accident because they were bad people or any worse off than you guys. We're all bad people. That's part of the curse. That's, last week, Pastor Cody said it perfectly. We're all sinful people. No, no, no. The reason why the tower fell was because the world that we live in is fractured and it's broken. And the world that you and I live in in the context of our days is that we are living in a world under a curse. And that's why accidents take place. That's why there's tsunamis that wipe out hundreds of thousands of people. That's why there's earthquakes and, and tornadoes. That's why buildings fall over. That's why a couple years ago uh, at the, at the uh, state uh, the, uh, fair, there was a concert Huge gust of wind comes by, knocks the stage down, and a bunch of people die right here in Indianapolis. Accidents. Why, 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 why does that happen? It's not because they were bad people or any worse than anybody else. It's just we live in a fractured, broken world. This helps me understand my world and helps you understand to understand your world. Listen to what Paul said in Romans chapter 8. He said, against its will, all creation was subjected to God. Say it with me. Curse. You say, what curse is that? The curse from the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve disobeyed God. But the fruit. Not only was humanity plunged into a sinful condition, theologians call it the fall, but all of creation with humanity was subjected to the curse of God, meaning that the entire world we live in is fractured. Not completely, I'm so thankful for that. Anybody else? There's beauty in this world, and there's things that work well in this world, and many, many days are, are, are wonderful and excellent and filled with blessings. But then there's also, with all of the blessing, a curse. And there's accidents. And they happen every single day. I think I saw a stat that said there are 90 fatal car accidents every single day. 
in the midst of all the blessing and all the goodness. Why? Why? We live under a curse. But, and here's the good news. And this is huge. This helps me. It needs to help you. But with eager hope, the creation, all of the world, looks forward to the day when, watch this, it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. Is anybody excited about that? What is Paul talking about? He's talking about how one day Christ will return and he will restore everything. He will restore every human being and and cut out their sinful nature and there'll be no more stealing and there'll be no more deception and there'll be no more disease and no more tornadoes because guess what? He will also redeem creation. And the winds and the waters and there'll be no more tsunamis and there'll be no more earthquakes because one day God will redeem everything. So what does that mean? Well, when you see an accident of any kind, whether it involves human error or it doesn't, you know it's evidence that we live in a fractured world and the only solution is God who will one day restore everything. So what do we do? We turn to him. What does it mean to repent? It means you turn to God, the only source of healing for your soul and for creation. Understand? We repent. But number two, we also must trust When we turn to God, we must trust in God. I'm going to say something very powerful, very true statement. There are no accidents with God. You say, but Pastor Danny, you're talking about accidents. They're all over the place. No, there are no accidents with God. There's only two options. God has either ordained the event. It was his idea. He planned it. Or he allowed it to happen. He didn't want it to happen, but he allowed it to happen. How do I understand that? How do I know that those, there's only two options? It's because of this truth in the scriptures that we learn about God. I'll show it to you. God is sovereign. Which simply means that God is in control of all of human affairs, of all human events. Whether they be natural situations with the weather or the earth, or they be car accidents or plane accidents or whatever the case. God is sovereign. Which means he oversees it. He's either orchestrated it and planned it, or he's allowed it to happen. Now, if that's not true, think about the reverse. The reverse would would say this. God is not in control. Now, if God is not in control, pass the Xanax, and let's crack open a six-pack and all get blitzed. (laughs) I'm I'm not joking. Like, I'd be the first one to become a drug addict. Sign me up, because I don't, I, I, I don't know how to cope with reality. Because that means that, that no one's in control, and anyone can do whatever they want, and all evil is possible, and there's no, it's all random chance, and there's no explanation for tornadoes, or earthquakes, or tsunamis, or murder, or rape, or anything, if God is not in control. So let's just check out. Now, how many people are checking out every day with drugs and alcohol? How many? How many? Methamphetamines. Opioids. Well, that makes sense to me because they're having to deal with this reality of a fractured system, a broken system where there's parents that abuse their children and their brothers who abuse their sisters. And I mean, it's just, it's just ridiculous. How do you cope with that? You get drunk, you get high, you get blitzed and you check out from reality. I'd be right there too if I did not believe God was in control. Make sense? Listen to what God says about himself through the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah 45, verse 7. I create light, and I make the darkness. I send good times, and I send bad times. I, the Lord, am the one who does this. I love this about God. He doesn't shy away from this truth that he's responsible. He owns it. He says, this is my world. And everything that's happening here is under my control. Did you know, did you know, this, the book of Job is famous in the Bible because of Job's sufferings. He lost everything, right? Did you know that Satan had to go to God to get permission to make Job suffer? Did you know that? Why? Because God's in control. God has the final say. Chuck Swindoll, author, pastor, said it like this. Nothing touches me that has not passed through the hands of my heavenly Father. Nothing. This is what it looks like to believe in the sovereignty of God. Anything that happens to me, accidents caused by me, accidents caused by other, evil deeds caused by other people, nothing touches my life that has not first passed through the hands of my heavenly Father. He has either 
orchestrated it or he has allowed it. Now, for some of you, you're hearing that. You're like, man, that doesn't make me feel good about God. Because I have got some serious pain in my life. I've lost loved ones. There's been a horrible accident that ended in the death of my son or whatever. I understand. It's tough. That's why you have to believe the second truth about God, not just the first one. You have to believe and trust that God is sovereign, but you also have to believe and trust that God is going to bring about some good through this. God will work it out for your good. There's something that he will bring from this accident that will be good for you in your life. How do we know that? Here's what the scriptures teach in Romans chapter 8, verse 28. Perhaps the most important scripture in the Bible that causes or produces peace in our soul. And we know that God causes everything, both the good and the bad, to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. What a massive idea this is in the scriptures. That means that anything that's happening in my life, because God is sovereign and his heart is good and he's doing something good, he's going to work it together to bring something good out of it. We don't know what that is. We might not find out for a year, two years, five years, but we know that God is going to bring something good out of this situation, this detour that we're on. And that is the reality that produces peace. I know so many Christ followers that believe in Jesus. They're not a fan. They're a follower. They're following, but they have very little peace. And here's why. You're not trusting that God is going to do something good on this detour. And so you're filled with fear. You're filled with anxiety. Maybe some anger, a lot of frustration. But peace, not so much. Why? Because you are not trusting in the sovereignty and in the goodness of God's heart. So we have to repent, number one. We've got to turn to the, one who, the only one who can solve the problem of the human heart and the creation of the world. And then we also have to trust in his heart. And then number three, and this one you might not think would be the case in this situation, but it is. I really do believe it is. We have to help. Every time, anytime there's an accident, somebody needs help. <laughs> The problem is, is that we're so upset with our own pain that we've been put out and, and now we've got to come up with some money or we've got to drive down this road we've never been down that we're, we're, we're not paying attention to other people. We're just focused on our own pain. Did you know there's a body of research out there that says that if you could get yourself, your mind and your focus off of your own pain and onto the pain of others, it would heal your soul? I mentioned the story of Joseph in week number one. Probably the greatest story in the Bible about detours. His brothers sold him into slavery, all 12 of them. Then he gets falsely accused of raping Potiphar's wife, gets thrown into jail. You talk about a life of detours. Did you know that the Bible says throughout all of that, it says that God was with Joseph, God was with Joseph, God was with Joseph. Here's why. Because he was doing the repentance and the trusting, which put him in a situation where he could then look to the pain of others. So he's in jail, falsely accused, and all of a sudden two new guys show up. The king's cupbearer, he served them the king the wine, Pharaoh's king, Pharaoh's uh, cupbearer, and then Pharaoh's baker shows up, the one who bakes the bread. Apparently they got crossed with each other, so he threw them both in jail. Joseph's in jail, they show up. They spend a day together, they go to sleep, watch what happens the next morning. Genesis chapter 40. When Joseph saw them the next morning, he noticed. What a powerful word. He took notice that they both looked upset. You know what? They they should have walked in and said, Joseph, why are you so upset? Joseph should have been over in the corner, you know, uh, in a fetal position, crying about being falsely accused of rape and how his brothers, you know, turned their back on him. And yet Joseph is noticing their pain. What's that called? That's called empathy. How did Joseph have empathy for these two guys when his situation was totally derailed and he was on a total detour? He was repenting and he was trusting in God. So he noticed. And look what he says. Why do you guys look so worried today? Who cares about these guys? Joseph, what about your situation? No, he's he's okay with his situation. And he's looking at them. And they say, well, we've had these dreams and we don't know what they mean. And, you know, uh, we're confused. Well, Joseph says, I know a guy. That's my translation. He says, I know a guy. And sure enough, Joseph interprets both of their dreams and 
They both come true. It works out great for the cupbearer. doesn't work out so great for the baker. He loses his, John the Baptist, loses his head. The one request that Joseph had of the cupbearer was, hey, when you get out, don't forget me. Well, he does. The cupbearer forgets Joseph. Two more years go by. He's in jail. Finally, Pharaoh has this dream. He didn't know what it means, so he goes to the cupbearer, and the cupbearer is like, ah, I know a guy. <laughs> He's in jail. He interpreted by, totally forgot. His name's Joseph. He knows how to interpret dreams. Go get him. And it turns out that the help that Joseph gave the cupbearer was the key that unlocked the prison doors for him. Some of you didn't hear me, see? Some of you didn't hear me. I'm going to say it again. It turns out that the help that Joseph gave the cupbearer was the key that unlocked the prison door. See, some of you are in a prison right now because you're, you're on a detour and you're in a prison of anger. You're in a prison of frustration. You're in a prison of fear. You're in a prison of worry. And, and, and you're so frustrated and you're locked up. You know what the key is to get out of that prison? To get your focus off your pain onto the pain of others. And that is the key to unlocking that prison door. I have a friend, her name is Jenny. She's also my assistant. She's sitting down front here. Four years ago, her precious husband, Brian, passed away from cancer. Fantastic Christ follower. Wonderful husband. Incredible father. Got cancer. We prayed for him. He did chemo. He did this. He did that. Experimental drugs, all that stuff. God just said no. It was Brian's time. And I got a front row seat to watch Jenny walk through the death of her husband, which is per perhaps the most difficult thing a person can go through, maybe other than the death of a child. And I watched her take steps of healing. So I asked her last week, I said, you know, uh, what was like the, one of the biggest things you did in the process of healing and um, losing Brian? And she said that, for one whole year, for 365 days, she wrote a handwritten note to someone else to encourage them and to bless them for 365 days in a row. And I remember that because she wrote me one. <laughs> and she said, getting my focus on the welfare of other people and the pain of other people helped to heal my heart. It turns out that the, the key that unlocks the prison that you're in, some of you are in today, is the help that you give to others. What have I said today? It is tough to navigate accidents. It's confusing, it's emotional, you get angry, it's time consuming, it can cause you to doubt your faith. How do we do it? We repent, we trust, and we help. Now, it's like I'm handing the ball off to you. I'm the quarterback. I'm going to say, hey, you, here's the ball. You run with it. How will you handle the next accident that comes your way? That's the question. It's about to pop up. There it is. <laughs> How will you navigate? Here's the ball. I'm giving it to you. I just, I just told you the play. Here's the play. Repent, trust, and help. This isn't even a sermon. Did you know that? This is not a sermon. No, 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 no. This is a game plan. You know what I did with this sermon? I sat down and I looked at how do I navigate the accidents in life? Oh, I, I, I look to God, I repent, I, I trust in him, and, and I try to help others. I just gave you the game plan so that the next time a detour comes into your life, it doesn't send you in a downward spiral and derail your life or permanent, permanently derail your life. The ball is now in your hands. What will you do? Now, today is baptism weekend. I know a lot of you are here to see your friends get baptized. Now, here's why I love baptism, because it is a picture of repentance. Think about it. It's kind of weird. We're putting people in water. It's like, what? What are, we do? what are you doing? Here's why. The water is symbolic of a person saying, I'm dead. I'm dying to the old way of doing things. And I'm symbolically coming up washed of my sins, and I'm going to go a totally different direction. That's what baptism is. I'm done being the boss of my own life, and I'm now going to follow Christ. And before we baptize some of your friends here today, I want you to hear uh, the story of uh, some friends of mine, Scotty and Brianne. And they, uh, they have given their lives to Christ, and they're following him with their whole heart. Check out their story. You know, I was brought up in church. You know, I've always been a believer in God. 
when I started here at Emmanuel, it was about 2009, and that's really when my faith, I think for me, that's when I became more of a follower instead of just a fan of Christ. I've been through a couple relationships, you know, in my life, long-term ones, and kind of knew in my heart there wasn't someone I was going to marry, so I kind of gave that over to God. I said, okay, you send me somebody. So I was single a long time, and then I met Brianna, and she didn't have a lot of upbringing in church, which is fine, she's a great girl. And things got kind of a little bit rocky there after about a year or so we were dating, and she kind of approached me and she's like, what can I do, you know, to help make our relationship healthier? I said, start going to church with me. She said, okay. I did not grow up in a Christian home. I did not um, know anything about church. I'm just kind of a traditional family. I played a lot of sports. I didn't excel at academics all that well. I was, I was great with extracurricular activities, but I was lost. I had a bad attitude about a lot of things. When we first got involved, he was uh, very adamant about coming to church on Sunday at nine o'clock and I never wanted to come. I just kinda was like, no, I'm gonna stay at home and you know, not come. So he in, uh, in turn wouldn't, wouldn't go either. So I could see how that was affecting him. When I gave church a chance, when I started coming, I got saved the first day. It was a chance for me to have something new. Life after baptism has taken me on so many journeys. I am a completely different person than I was when I first started. The strength and courage I've been able to draw from the Lord and to just branch out and do everything that I do solely comes from Him. I, I would be nothing without Christ, and I do so much better with Him in my life than I ever did before. If you don't know Jesus, you're selling yourself short of a lot of blessings and favor and positive things that could be happening in your life. But he's really blessed us beyond what I could even think or imagine. He really has. And I give credit to God for what we have, hands down. And if it weren't for her getting baptized and accepted Jesus Christ her Savior, I don't even know if we'd still be together, honestly. You know, we give a lot of people chances in our lives. We know a lot of people, we meet a lot of people throughout our lives and give them chances to know us, to be involved in our lives personally. So why not give Jesus a chance? You can only gain from accepting Jesus Christ as your Savior. There's a faith that stands to fight Sins get lying to its knees I've seen his praise of rebel shadows
I would want Pastor Cody to do it. Don't you agree? I mean, he can get you down and he can get you up. Make sure all that sin is washed away. <laughs> hey, maybe today is your moment. Maybe today is the day where you reach out to God 
and you repent. This is the message. If Jesus, if Jesus were here, he would say this. How do I know that? Because he said it. And Matthew recorded his words. Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. He simply said this. Repent and turn to God. Turn your life over to God. Why? Because the kingdom of heaven is near. See, that's our issue. We came into this world as little kings and little queens. Anybody raising kids? Right? They want to call the shots. Where's that come from? It comes from the curse in the Garden of Eden. We all want to be in charge of our life. We all want to run the show. We all want to be little kings and little queens. Jesus said, repent of that. Turn away from being in charge of your life and step into my kingdom. Let me be the king of your life. That's where eternal life is found. That's where abundant life is found. Following Christ. He died for you. He spread out his arms 2,000 years ago and took your sin and my sin upon himself, making it possible to be in a relationship with himself. Will you reach out to him today? Maybe today is your day where you trust in him and you repent. If that's you right now, if you feel led to watching online or here at Greenwood, I'm gonna say a simple prayer of faith. Take these words, make them your own, reach out to God and repent and step into his kingdom. Will you pray with me? Just say this to him, dear Jesus, I turn from my own kingdom, my own queendom. I'm no longer the boss. I turn to you, the true king, and I ask you to take control. I ask you to be the leader of my life. You call the shots, I repent. I believe you died on the cross to prove your love for me. You took the penalty of my sin upon yourself. You conquered sin by rising from the grave to make me your child. And so today, I reach out in faith. I place my trust in you. And I ask you to be my king. From this day forward, give me the wisdom to follow you to obey you and to honor you with my life. I pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Can we give God glory, church? Amen. Woo! If you just prayed that prayer, if you just stepped into the kingdom of God, we put together a little box for you. We call it our saved box. Inside this box, there's a Bible with a reading plan for you to start reading the scriptures. There's some information about baptism, small groups getting connected to the church, and there's also a cup, a coffee cup in here to say congratulations on trusting Christ. If you prayed that prayer, text the word SAVED to 65248 and grab one of these here. If you're here at Greenwood at the information desk, if you're watching online, put a little bit more information in there. We'll send one of these to you in the mail. One more time. Can we give God glory, church? Amen. He's changing lives. At this time, I am going to hand things off to the local teams, and then they'll close you out.